Pardon the interruption, but I'm Mike Wilbon, Tony. I got a black eye today. But you should see the other guy. I'm Tony Kornheiser. I hear the other guy was a tarmac. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, Scottsdale yeah. Airport hey. chipped over my own luggage. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. More embarrassing than pain. How about that? Boston. No, uh, looks fine. I mean, I had the big better head than me. over here but, last you know. night. I've got ice treatments, like, you know, like I went 12 really? rounds with somebody. Looks better. Looks better than I thought. Welcome to PTI, boys and girls. In today's episode, the Knicks win, the Rangers sweep, and Wilbon's favorite event of the sporting calendar, the NFL draft, is in the books. But we begin today with a sweep in the NBA playoffs. Playoff neophyte Minnesota eliminated playoff veteran Phoenix last night in Phoenix, 122 to 116. This was the only game of their four-game series that was close. Minnesota dominated Phoenix. Wilbon, are you focused on the ascent of the T-Wolves or the descent of the Suns? Tony, I'm torn with this, as you know, because I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm here. I'm in Scottsdale, Arizona. Everybody here today is either yeah. down or angry. It seems to be an even split about the Suns, who have to be the most disappointing team in the league this season, given where Vegas had them, you know, when the season began in late October. The, the Suns were the big three were like the, the, the biggest minus, the worst big, the worst threesome in the entire league, that threesome. How's that possible? Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, Bradley Beal. But, Tony, and so there's – I know we can say, oh, we got time to talk about Minnesota. No, Tony, you know where I've been. You know where I've been on Anthony Edwards all season, ahead of most – I bet you when the votes come out, when they're tabulated for MVP, I'm the only person, the only voter who will have had Anthony Edwards second, number two, behind only Joker in my MVP ballot. You can see it. That team is talented and tall and deep and starting to get arrogant and proficient and well-coached and well-led. And that team is all the things the Suns are not. And I think, and I've been wrong about a couple of these series, but I think that Minnesota can give Denver, yes, presuming that Denver wins, and I think Denver loses game five, by the way, to the Lakers, but Denver will prevail. I think Minnesota could really, really push Denver to the brink. They're that good. Yeah. So I want to praise their ascension and note again okay. the wonder that is Anthony Edwards. So I see you went to the glasses. Now I feel like yes. I'm working with Roy Orbison. I really like that look on you. <laughs> so as you know, I root for Minnesota because of an assistant coach, Nathan Bubis. Yes. And I rooted for yes. them all last year when you repeatedly called them the dumbest team in the NBA. They were. I don't want to go overboard on the ascension of Minnesota because there's another young ascending team in the West in Oklahoma City. And yes. Denver, a team that You're has right. ascended, is also young. And it's going to be very tough for anybody to get by two of those teams. So I'm going to concentrate on the descent of the Suns. The guy who bought the team a year and a half ago, whenever it was, paid way too much Ishba. money and then began, then began a series of moves that remind me of the guy who bought the Carolina Panthers. He fired a perfectly competent coach and couldn't wait to do it. He brought in very expensive talent in Kevin Durant and Bradley Beal. I'm going to go for a while here. Kevin Durant and Bradley Beal. Let's look at Kevin Durant. He has won championships with an already established championship team. Wherever he had influence on the culture, in Oklahoma City, in Brooklyn, and now in Phoenix, he hasn't won. Bradley Beal was brought in an allegedly great player. He's not a great player. He's a high-volume scorer on a bad team. He's never won anything. The three of them are owed, with Devin Booker, $150 million next year. And as you said, they were minus 37, minus 50, minus 51, 51, minus 51. in this series when they were on the court together. So I, they appear to be a disaster at the moment. And I'm done now. Thank you. <laughs> Tony, I, I'm not going to disagree with anything you said about that. I don't, they can't run it back. People are saying that because they have no roster flexibility. They better, and Bradley Beal's got a no-trade deal. And he, Devin Booker's a franchise. I don't know what they can do. Woo. No. No. We're going to do something a little different right now. Tony, we're going to wish happy trails right here in the A block. Happy trails to Philly fans who let a horde of New Yorkers invade their building yesterday as the Knicks beat the Sixers by five to go up 3-1 in that best-of-seven series. Jalen Brunson was amazing, scored 47, serenaded by chance of MVP in Philly. Joel Embiid yeah. called the turnout disappointing. Tony, do you come to praise the Knicks 
and their fans, or as I will, bury not the Sixers, but their fans. Okay, so I'm going to do something that I know I have your approval when I say that in the old days, Nick fans would not have been in Philadelphia, and they certainly would not That's have right. worn Nick stuff. And if this was That's a football right. game in the old days, Eagles fans would have beaten them up and then yes. be hauled off to a jail inside the In deck. the building. Okay. Yes. Right. I don't, I don't personally believe that the Knicks fans have anything to do with the outcome of that game. I, I mean, I really don't. I think it's the fact that, that Joel Embiid is basically hobbled. He can't move. I saw him get a shot blocked. In this game, and the best player on the court was Jalen Brunson, who had 47. Yep. And you know what, Mike? They're not going to boo Jalen Brunson because he played at Villanova. And they're not going to boo Josh Hart, who's 6'4 and had 17 rebounds, because didn't he play yeah. at Villanova as well? Joel Embiid guaranteed the Sixers are going to win this series. I, I, that's not looking really good right now. But I don't want to rip Embiid, I, even though he's yappy about the fans. I don't want to because he's out there playing hurt, and he's trying his best. But I would ask you to tell me again, how many, how many Eastern Conference finals he's been to? Because I think it's less yeah. than one. I think it's less yeah. than one. And it doesn't look like it's going to be one now either, Tony. I agree with what you said. Man, let me go back to Philly. Because, you know, they like to give it to everybody. And so today, Philly fans, you got to get as well as you give. Because they were weak, tepid, didn't show, came late acted scared, didn't support the team. They let the New York Knicks fans, probably the most obnoxious fans in all the sports in some ways, overrun their building. Knicks fans went in there and took over. Tony, I think it did have some. I think they got juiced by it. I think the Knicks did that. Okay. Jalen Brunson, Jalen Brunson's been great all season. Their votes he's yeah. going to get for MVP, by the way. He's great in this series. They can't touch him in the last two games after two bad shooting games. But Philly, come on, man. Joel Embiid's out there on one leg. Philly fans like to give it to everybody. Philly people, Philly media, the loud mouths in the Philly media, they want to tell you how weak you are and how great they are. They were, my favorite word now, Tony, junk yesterday. They okay. were weak. Pocus, pocus, get off junk. the stage. Yeah. Get them out of here. Well, to be fair, the Philadelphia 76ers at home shot 6 of 24 in the fourth quarter when you have to do better. Yeah. They weren't any yeah. good. They weren't any good. You know, they and Tyrese Maxey and Joel Embiid, 15 for 40. So, They're you know, lame wasn't very fans. Good. We moved to hockey, where this year's President's Trophy winners, the New York Rangers, swept their division rivals, Washington Capitals, out of the playoffs. In these playoffs so far, the Rangers have scored more goals, 15, than any team in the East. They have allowed fewer goals, seven, than any team in the league. Plus, they held Alex Ovechkin to no points in four games. Will Bonner, are you now going to make the Rangers the favorites? Tony, I don't know. I mean, you still got the Bruins, who are in the process of taking out Toronto, which is something they do with some regular... The President's Trophy, because that team has not won in the last 10 seasons. The last team to do it was your Chicago Blackhawks, I believe, in 2013. Um, you know, the Boston Bruins last year had the greatest regular season of all time. And they went out yeah, in the first out, round out, to an yeah. eighth seed. And that has happened six times, I believe, since 2006, getting bounced by an eight in the first round. So, it's, so you're on shaky grounds if you declare the Rangers great right now. I'm going to agree with what you said about the Capitals. They were the last team into the playoffs. They had the worst goal differential, minus 37 of a playoff team in the last 30 years. On the other hand, the Rangers handled them completely. They did. And I, they think, I think holding Alexander Ovechkin to no points is, right. is, is something that you can talk about for the next series. I mean, they did exactly what they were supposed to do. No hiccups, none. Let's take a break. Coming up, baseball pledges to make changes to its uniforms. Is their timeline too long? And I'll give you my totally unbiased take on the NFL draft. I don't have my Bears cap on. I'm so worried about my eye and sunglasses. And thanks to Deanna. Deanna Jordan, she, she, she made me up, Tony. I, I mean, you know, I don't look that bad, right? I mean, I'm all right. Thanks to Oh, Deanna. you look fine, but I, you got to uh, tip her at least 50. You got to give her a 50. She surgery. I, uh, come on. A lot more than... If you're just joining us, Wilbon looks like he fought Matt Rempe, but he's fine. Let me see what's first here. Mail time. Go to the going glasses. back to the sunglasses, though. 
What was your biggest takeaway from the NFL draft? Are you kidding me? Huh? Let me, let me give a nod to the Kansas City Chiefs for maneuvering to get themselves worthy, the wide receiver from University of Texas, who I think has been, it's been reported he's has the fastest time at the combine ever, any combine ever. Right. So ever. So like 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 Patrick Mahomes needs another weapon. Then when they're gonna call him Cheetah Two, I mean it's unbelievable they they get him. But no, the Bears, Tony, the Chicago Bears had the draft. Not only getting my man, my quarterback, Caleb Williams, but getting Roma Dunze to throw to in future years. Those two guys come in together, and we get a punter from Iowa who I've seen kick outdoors. He kicks outdoors in the rain and the wind and the cold, and he's like Thunderfoot, part two from Iowa. This goes back to Reggie Roby. I've watched him kick at Wrigley Field, fourth to fifth round. We get a lineman from Yale that I'm glad we got. The Bears seem to have done a fabulous job. Now let's go tee it up. I'm ready to start the season now. I have to honestly say I never thought we'd get into punter talk when we talked about the NFL draft, the biggest takeaway I have is that the Atlanta Falcons took Michael Penix Jr. to take him at eight. They took him at eight. They had yeah. just signed Kirk Cousins Thankfully. to a $180 million contract, yeah. $100 million guaranteed. guaranteed. guaranteed and so to now, Charles. before Kirk Cousins takes a single snap, they have drafted his replacement. Whose brilliant idea was that? Do people really think Kirk Cousins is not going to be upset with a circumstance like that? This is the absurd quality of the owner of the Atlanta Falcons. My other takeaway, Mike, was offensive players. The first 14 players picked in the draft were all offensive players. Six of the first 12 were quarterbacks. Seven in the first round were wide receivers, and then the first two, I believe, in the second round were wide receivers. And my, so why would you play defense in college? Why would you even do it? Because look where the gold is. The gold is on the other side of the line. Well, the but I agree with you about back. the Bears. The Bears. I agree with you about the Bears. They better be good right now because they're, they're built to be good right now. Wanna Caleb good. Williams is good. Want to be good. good right now, Tony? They're good. You, be, you go to college and play defense, you can stop. All that offense is coming in the league. The pendulum will swing back. Yeah, but the money is going out to the offense right now. Baseball will reportedly make changes to its uniforms no later than the start of next season. Soon enough for you? This was such a stupid issue. I'm not going to call it a non-issue. I got to go to different glasses now because I want to read a quote that was in the memo that got leaked and was sent to the players. And here's the quote. This is so funny, Tony. At its core, what has happened here is Nike was innovating something that didn't need to be innovated. That is so cool and crushing. And, Tony, it didn't need to be innovated. I mean, Major League Baseball, you know, okay, you make them lighter, you go to some synthetic material, you make it so that, you know, players, I don't know, feel more aerodynamic, but you don't need to spend all this time on it and change the uniforms multiple times and make them look just sort of cheap and floozy-like, you don't need that. So enough with this story. Go back to the uniforms. That's what they all apparently do. It is absurd to wait until next season. We're talking about baseball uniforms. We're not talking about portrait gallery oil paintings here. You can make a 1,000 of these in a day. You can make 5,000 of these in a day. Baseball has to admit these uniforms stink and we're getting rid of them. They should be New uniforms by May 15th. They already have the measurements on all of the players, right? That's right. And these things look absolutely terrible. I was watching the Nats the other day on Saturday. The starting pitcher of the Nats, this is in Miami, starting pitcher of the Nats is drenched in sweat by the third inning. He's wearing the road grays. It looks like he has fallen into a pond. I could not take my eyes off him because it looks so terrible. The notion that they would wait until the beginning of next season is awful. This, it's so just lame. awful. Get it this done. Lame. Get it done. This is not this hard. Lame Enough as Philly fans at that game Let, yesterday. Let's take one last break still to come. Ezekiel Elliott heads back to Big D. And Candace Parker calls it a career. I mean, you shouldn't, uh, people sweat all the time, but you shouldn't be drenched in it. It just, no. it looks bad. Baseball knows it looks bad. The players hate the uniforms, and they're correct.
They're correct. Change it ain't the that universe. hard. It's a baseball uniform. It's not a suit no. for an astronaut. They're not going near no. the sun. Happy time, people. Happy 90th birthday, Luis Aparicio. The Hall of Fame shortstop was Rookie of the Year with the White Sox in 1956, Wilbon, before you were born. Aparicio played short for the White Sox, Orioles, and Red Sox. He was on Baltimore's World Series champions in 1966. He was a nine-time gold glove, a nine-time stolen base leader in the American League. Aparicio was a 262 career hitter with 2,677 hits. But he had only 18, I'm sorry, 83 home runs in 18 seasons. Aparicio was in the era of good field no-hit shortstops, which changed forever in the American League with the coming of shortstops like Cal Ripken, Derek Jeter, and no more Garcia Parra. Tony, at that time in Chicago, you almost always heard him referred to as Little Louis Aparicio. He combined with Nellie Fox, second base and shortstop. They were 1-2 in MVP in 1959 when the White Sox got to the World Series and lost to the Dodgers. But my dad is a Southsider, not a Cup fan. My dad is a White Sox fan, and Louis Aparicio was his favorite player. And that's who we went to watch. When I was a little, little kid in my father's arms, Louis Aparicio was the first ball player I ever understood or knew or recognized. Happy anniversary, Roger Clemens. On this day 38 years ago, when he was pitching for the Red Sox, the Rockets set a major league record by striking out 20 Seattle Mariners. The only other pitchers who have struck out 20 in nine innings are Kerry Wood and Max Scherzer. Both were after Clemens, and Clemens is the only one to do it twice. Randy Johnson struck out 20 for the Diamondbacks in 2001. But because that game lasted 11 innings, Johnson doesn't get credit for this list, though his strikeouts were in nine innings. In recent years, we've had 17 strikeouts by Chris Sale and 16 by Lance Lynn and Spencer Strider. Wilbon, do you think we'll see 20 again? No, because a guy could have 15 strikeouts after six innings and some dope would take him out for fear that he, he can't get through the lineup a third straight time. And what they think of starting pitching relative to their analytics means, no, they don't care about that. They would yank a guy out if he had 19 to start the ninth. No, we, we're not going to see it, and it's too bad. Baseball has gone down a rabbit hole when it comes to this, and it's regrettable. Ladies and gentlemen, hot take by Michael Wilbon. Happy yes. trails, Candace Parker. Wilbon's favorite female basketball player has officially walked away from playing yes, the game and has is. walked towards commenting on it. Parker was the WNBA's number one pick in 2008 by the LA Sparks after a great career at Tennessee, where she won two national championships for Pat Summit. Parker was both Rookie of the Year and League MVP in 2008. She won her first title in 2016 with the Sparks and was Finals MVP. Parker won a second title in 2021 with Chicago and a third title in 2023 with Las Vegas. Parker was a seven-time All-Star, a two-time Olympic gold medalist. Parker says she's retiring because of physical pain and multiple surgeries, but she has desk jobs now with Turner for the NBA and CBS for the NCAAs. Tony, I know you know this feeling. There, there, there are people who sometimes come from where you come from, and they are such a credit to your community in terms of the way they comport themselves, their professionalism, th their charisma, their toughness, their intellect. Candace Parker's all those things, yes, on a basketball court, but often for the community I come from, we come from Chicago. And I, I say that in admiration to the point that I am just proud to know her and be in her orbit occasionally. And I went to Sky Games to watch Candace Parker, and I'm glad she's been on our show. I hope she will do that again in the future. I love to see her whenever she's on. Cheers to Candace Parker. Let's go to the big finish. Ezekiel Elliott reportedly returning to the Cowboys on a one-year deal. Does that make sense? Yeah, they lost Tony Pollard. They don't have a lead dog at the position, even though people don't think running backs are necessary anymore. Hope it works out for Zeke. The fight between Mike Tyson and Jake Paul will be an official eight-round professional fight that counts for and against their records, not an exhibition. Your thoughts? Uh, I, nobody cares about Mike Tyson's record anymore, but the closest this can get to a real fight is that's what we want to see. Thunder coach Mark Dagnall was named NBA Coach of the Year. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, Tony, it does. His team was one, the one seed in the tough West, and they've justified it now up 3-0 in the first round of the playoffs. Yes, it makes sense. 
Canucks came back from down 3-1 to tie the Preds with under three minutes left. Then won an OT. Your thoughts? I'm now watching the Western Conference playoffs, and they seem to be great. I've got to start watching, I think. Last one, Nuggets and Thunder can close out the first-round series tonight, but will they? I'm going to surprise you, Tony. I think both those series continue. I think the Lakers get one in Denver tonight. That sounds insane, but I think they do. And I think New Orleans will get one as well. We're out of time. We will try and do better the next time. And I'm Tony Kornheiser. I'm Mike Wilbon. Same time tomorrow, Knuckleheads. You can get the podcast on the ESPN Apple. Apple Podcast. Deanna, your surgeon. Thank you. Here's SportsCenter. I think everyone's going to want a bonus topic. All right, Wilbon, which player has been the star of the NBA postseason thus far? One player, not 80, one player. All right, one player, but I got to give you nominees, right? So Kyrie Irving, who I don't give a lot of love to on this show or any show, has been great. His three-point shooting alone puts him on this list. Joker, of course. Shea Gilgis-Alexander has been terrific. Anthony Davis, even though Joker spun him around in one of those fourth quarters, has been terrific. How can you not have Joel Embiid as a nominee? Because he had a fitty, and he's doing it on one leg. But the real two, the two you got to choose between, are Jalen Brunson and Anthony Edwards. They are. But Jalen Brunson at the beginning, and that, you know, that's my guy, Chicago's own, he had a couple games, Tony, where the shooting percentage was really low. He didn't shoot it well, and he's been great lighting it up ever since. Anthony Edwards is drop the notebook, drop the mic. Anthony Edwards is the new star of the NBA, capable of being the face. He and Brunson. But uh, come on. I voted him second for MVP, Tony, behind only Joker. He is the goods. Okay. So what the playoffs have been characterized by so far is actually a great absence of people that we have come to look at as stars. Steph Curry not in the playoffs. LeBron in danger of losing, leaving the playoffs. Um, Jimmy Butler hasn't played. Am I correct on that? Giannis hasn't played. Zion, I don't know that he's played. Kawhi Leonard has played, hasn't been great. Joel Joel Embiid is hobbled. Durant is out. And I know that you love Edwards, and I know you love Gilgis Alexander, and you love Halliburton, and you love Brunson. Yes. But to me, the number one star, because of the expectations on him, and the performance going against Anthony Davis is Jokic. He should yeah. be the MVP yeah. this year. I understand that. In the playoffs, if I have these numbers correct, 29 points, 15 rebounds, 10 assists every single game. Uh, he's, he's it. He's it for me so far. Him. Yeah. Yeah. Now, hey, nobody's voting against Joker. And that would just be stupid. But I'm just saying, come on now, Ant-Man on the verge of superhero. That's it. We're done. Back to you. Beautiful.